Very cool. Well, hello, retro game players. Thank you for tuning in. I'm Marcus, and welcome to another episode of Retro Gaming Sunset. On this episode of Retro Gaming Sunset, we've got more special guests bringing you everything from retro games and beyond. So sit back, grab some popcorn, and let's hit the movie theater in Movie Machine with our bro, Jatandi. My name is Chitandi and welcome to Movie Machine. Before I get started, thank you so much Marcus for inviting me. This is so awesome, it's so amazing to be part of this. So thank you so much. And now I present to you a really amazing movie. It's John Carpenter's The Thing from 1982. And it's pretty hard for a German to say The Thing. The Thing. The Thing. This movie is about a 12-man research team and they are on a research facility in the Arctic so they can't escape. You have like ice deserts all around them and blizzards and stuff like that. And they find an alien life form buried down in the snow that was there for 100,000 years and they take the alien with them to the research station. And yes, I don't want to spoil too much but as soon as the alien unfreezes, pretty awesome stuff is going to happen. I don't know what the hell's in there. It's weird and pissed off, whatever it is. Bennings, go get Childs. What is this? What's, it coming? What's going on? What's it coming? Hey, Parker, what is it? I don't know. Wait, Childs! Mac wants the flamethrower. Mac wants the what? That's what he said. Now move! can mimic people, it can change its form and pretend to be some of the characters and you have this thriller going on there. Nobody knows who is the alien, nobody knows who is real. Now I'll show you what I already know. It's a crock of shit. Let's try the Doc and Clark. And Clark was human, huh? Which makes you a murderer, don't it? Palmer now. This is pure nonsense. Doesn't prove a thing. I thought you'd feel that way, Gary. You were the only one that could have got to that blood. We'll do you last. It's a sci-fi thriller horror movie and it combines so many awesome stuff. John Carpenter's The Thing is a remake from the original The Thing from Another World from 1951. The music in this film is so amazing. John Carpenter was known for composing the music for his own movies just to save money but again he's a master of atmospheric horror movie 
music and it definitely fits and adds up to the atmosphere of the film. The effects in the movie are just outstanding. Again, this movie is over 30 years, almost 35 years old, but the effects are amazing. And it can get pretty gory in the movie if you get the uncut version here. On the cover it says, man is the warmest place to hide. And it reminds me a little bit of Alien from 1979 and you had this slogan, in space no one can hear you scream. And I thought that this was a really good slogan, but I think man is the warmest place to hide can be misunderstood pretty easy. Maybe they're saying this in jail as well, I'm not really sure here guys. It kind of flopped in the box office cause of E.T. also from 1982 but soon after it became some kind of a classic and a fan favorite and it still is an amazing movie again with amazing effects, with amazing music, great characters, Kurt Russell plays the main role and I think he really nails the part and don't let me talk about the ending of the movie, this is so awesome. So yeah that's from me, go ahead check out John Carpenter's The Thing from 1982, again this movie definitely is worth her time. Thanks again, Marcus, for inviting me, and back to you! I couldn't agree with you more, man. That movie is so good. Kurt Russell's awesome, John Carpenter's the man. I've always been a fan of that guy. And yeah, what a great, great flick. So check out Jutani's channel if you have no idea who he is. He's a great dude, awesome content. And thanks again, bro, I appreciate it. And moving on from that Kurt Russell movie, our next guest also has an affinity toward Kurt Russell, I do believe, because he's gonna be talking about a game that's based off a Kurt Russell movie, sort of, maybe a little bit, we're not so sure. But anyway, let's go and check out Miles with Hikikori Media. Bring it out, bro, with the Game Slam. everyone, my name is Miles, the owner and operator of Hick Hickamore Media, the friendliest channel on YouTube, they say, second only to Uwe Ball Raw. Baseball is shit and no real sport, sorry to say it, but it's just completely bullshit to sit five hours in a stadium and watch that shit, only cricket is worse. Today I'll be talking about Hyper Dimension Neptunia for the PS3. The original version that I bought at launch and then a year later they remade it with better graphics and gameplay and pretty much everything else but that's okay a penny saved is a penny earned they say yeah they say a lot of things well that's all right I've already beaten the game and I'm ready to tell you all about it <laughs> excuse me what's with all the booing you mean you don't want me to talk about Hyper Dimension Neptunia? It's all too late for that. I've already captured over 500 hours of gameplay. Do you understand how many weeb references I had to stomach to make it through this piece of shit? It's dangerous to go alone. Take nap. Ha ha ha. Ha ha ha. More like it's a funny to nobody. You know what, Marcus? I know this is your fault somehow. You and your contrarian Elias retro game player base can't even sit around and say something nice for a change instead of shit posting on my channel. You can keep your containment field of shitty retro Pat the NES punk game players and your metal Jesus with your turkey necks. I don't need any of that around here. You know what? I do have something for you now that I think of it. Something with warmer sounds, you vinyl collecting, iron and wine listening to, bitch. Here it is right here. Firefighter FD-19. FD-18. Try this trick and spin it. Yeah. Take a trip with me down memory lane to the magical year of 2004. Imagine, if you will, that you're a Konami slave, I, I mean, developer, and you put out the critically acclaimed Silent Hill 3. You're on top of the world. So now what do you do? You've got this engine that's capable of creating thick layers of fog, beautiful fire effects, and gorgeous graphics that push the PS2 to its absolute limits. You think to yourself, hey, maybe I can get one more great Silent Hill game out of this engine before the end of the year. 
Nope, life has other plans. The boss comes in, he takes a bloody hemorrhoid shit on your desk, and he says, We're not an art studio, Socrates. I need you to fill my bank with round eye dollars, and I'm assigning you to the project. Hey, I thought I told you to throw out that Silent Hill 3 engine months ago! He looks you in the eye, and he says, I want to take Silent Hill in a new direction, and you're just not vibing with my vision of scary. Less fog, more ghosts. That's what the people want. Then he tells you to move your desk across the building again for the third time that day. After your 28 hour shift, you're tired, you go home, you drink a Sapporo and dust off your DVD of Backdraft and watch it, you sigh, and you say to yourself, man, I wish Kurt Russell would come and pull me away from the fire that is my existence. These flames that are growling like monsters, that's kind of stupid, Ron Howard. Wait, that's it! And that, my friends, was the maybe true story of how Firefighter FD-18 came to be. Okay, so in the game you play as a firefighter named Dean McGregor who's called into action when a terrorist sets fire to buildings all across Port Serena. You take your fire hose of unlimited length, your box kicking boots, and your fireman's axe and you get down to business because this game wastes no time getting good. The best way I could describe this game is it's an arcade-like firefighter simulation that also has some Contra and Fatal Frame and Silent Hill all mixed into one this game is just out of control you have this firefighter and you've got to run into these buildings and collect all these survivors and lost items and you're spraying everything in sight you've got this hose with these nozzles you can trade out so you can do fine mists or power blasts and you're fighting these sentient balls of fire they're like monsters they growl at you and they spawn other fires and catch cars and things and make them explode you've got a time limit kind of. You've got to run and go get that survivor before they die. They get added to your tally at the end where there's this mission screen where you're awarded medals of bravery depending on how well you did. So if you're not getting damaged, if you're collecting survivors, finding lost items, and destroying every fire monster in a timely manner, you're going to get a better medal. And there's also hidden achievements as you go along. So say you beat a level really quickly, maybe you might get a speedy medal, that sort of thing. The game is unpredictable and fun and very quick. There's only about four main stages and then they have about three or four sub stages a piece. So really it's all about repetition, learning the levels, going through and getting better and better times. It's relatively simple but there are some deep mechanics going on here so you can choose different strategies of how you want to clear out a room. For example, you've got these little three fire hydrants here which you can use to summon one of your fire firefighter friends that can take a shotgun blast full of water to clear out a pathway or to clear out some of the enemies in the areas. I know this seems like it would get really repetitive, but there's something relaxing about just clearing out a room of fire and taking your axe and busting down walls and kicking down fucking doors to get to these survivors that just need your help. There are also these unbelievably hilarious boss fights where like a pile of laundry is flying through the air trying to catch you on fire or you go into this office room and there are these fire tornadoes just swirling around trying to kill you and you gotta shoot at the base of each one of them. If you're into nonsense stories with crazy antagonists and something that always keeps you on your toes and revels in the fact that yes this is kind of a stupid idea but we're gonna have some fun with it then Firefighter FD18 comes at my highest recommendation. Go check it out. Wow, that game looks pretty interesting actually. I like firefighting games. The last one I played was the one on Sega CD or the 32X. It was Fahrenheit 9-11. And I'll tell you what, that game looks way cooler. So thank you for covering it, man. And hey guys, if you haven't checked out Miles' channel, Hikikomori Media, go check it out. It is definitely cool. Lots of cool reviews, very unique style. So check his stuff out. And hey man, you're totally right, dude. 
Pat the NES Punk and Metal Jesus both watched this show and they probably would have been a little bit upset if you had covered that game that you started to review. So good job switching it up. And you're right, I listen to Iron and Wine all the time. It's my favorite thing to do while I'm organizing my lawn clippings collection. So great call on that. And I'm gonna go listen to some of that right now. But next up is another great toy review in the old toy trunk. Today on Toy Trunk, we're going to be talking about the 2016 Comic-Con exclusives of the Ninja Turtle NECA video game series. Um, I'm very proud to say that I have this in my collection. No, I did not get a chance to go to Comic-Con, so unfortunately I had to buy these from someone who did go. I will say though uh, that it was very fairly priced. Um, not as fairly priced as what the booth was selling them for, so the actual NECA booth was selling these for $100 each. This is the Ninja Turtle one. I also got the Shredder and the Foot Clan one. So really not bad, 100 bucks for this. It has a fold up flap, it's very cool. Um, there's some things that I think are a little cheap about it and I'll talk about that in a second. But all in all, I love the NECA video game series. As you guys probably know, if you haven't seen the video where uh, I'm moving, you can check that out and I cover all of my NECA toys, which is quite a few, lots of the video game series, so I'm missing a few. But when these came out, being the Turtles fan that I am, I knew I had to get them. So that's what these are, and let's just uh, take a closer look. So the outside of the boxes are definitely pretty well done. The one on the left is the Ninja Turtle set, and I love the artwork. You know, Shredder looks awesome, April looks really cool, the turtles look cool. The artwork's very reminiscent of the arcade machine, which is great. The logo itself is not, however, it's kind of the newer turtles look, but that's okay. But yeah, it looks, it looks great, so that's a plus. But moving over to the Foot Clan box, I think it looks a little weird because it's the same exact image, except they overlaid fire and foot and then the Foot Clan logo, which I don't know. I just think they could have done maybe some artwork with Shredder and then the Foot Clan instead of just putting, you know, the fire there. But all in all, the outside of the boxes definitely looks good. Moving on to the back, you can actually see what kind of looks like almost the character select screen, uh, which I like. And the top part, you can see it's kind of like when you're playing the game, you know, or inserting a quarter to press start. And the Foot Clan one is similar. You know, you can see it says insert coins this time instead of press start. But I'm not sure if I like that it's turtles. Even though it's like the shell shock faces, I kind of wish it was more about like maybe the Foot Clan or maybe they came up with some cool, you know, 16-bit um, art that way. Now the size of the boxes are also sort of similar. You can see it's the same image, except they just overlaid fire and the foot. And then there's the sticker that actually says it's a 2016 Comic-Con exclusive, which I do think is pretty awesome. Now, similarly to a lot of the other NECA video game series, it does have an open-up kind of flip-down cover to reveal the figures themselves. And here you can see how cool they actually look. I mean, they're pixelated, you know, they have their weapons, and in the back you can see the overlay, sort of, of April O'Neil from, I think that's like the intro of the arcade game. They do have different hands that you can interchange, so that way, if you don't want them to hold their weapons, you know, they can be giving you a thumbs up or whatever. But they look great. I mean, these figures look so sharp to me, and I just love how the pixels are kind of drawn on them. I think they look really, really awesome. One thing you'll notice is the artwork on that drop-down panel is from the arcade overlay. That's really cool. You can see the joystick and the buttons. So that's definitely a plus for me and then here's shredder himself tonight i dine on turtle soup he's looking pretty badass love the pixel look on him especially i really dig that and then you'll notice the colors of the foot soldiers are all kind of arcade accurate and i really like their eyes too their eyes look really detailed i'm totally digging that i always like the foot soldiers eyes in the first ninja turtle movie actually 
So there you go, guys. That's uh, the box sets of the NECA 2016 Comic-Con exclusives. That's it for Toy Trump. Okay, moving on, we've got another special guest. This time it's Arthur with Pocket Rocket Radio bringing us the best of the music beat. Bring it out, man. Hi, guys. It's Arthur from Pocket Rocket Radio. And you're watching Music Beat on Retro Game Players. Now I'm going to talk to you guys about one of my favorite video game soundtracks ever. And this soundtrack is from the video game Transistor, which is made by Supergiant Games. Unfortunately, there is no physical release of the game as of yet, so I'll just show you a really pretty image of, like, the cover art. Uh, okay, no, this game's really good, and the soundtrack's freaking awesome. So I'm going to talk about it. Okay, here we go. So Transistor is an indie RPG developed by Supergiant Games. If you follow the indie gaming scene, the name might ring a bell since they also developed the indie hit Bastion. This game is terrific, has a unique storyline and beautiful artwork. However, I'm here to tell you about the soundtrack. Unfortunately, there aren't any physical releases of the soundtrack available, but you can download it digitally from several online stores, including Amazon and the Supergiant website. This is one of my favorite gaming soundtracks ever. It has a very unique mix of jazz, blues, electronica, trance, and ambient indie rock. It's some of the best atmospheric music I've ever heard. What's really impressive is the entire soundtrack was written and arranged by one musician, Darren Korb, with guest vocals performed by Ashley Barrett on some of the tracks. Darren Korb is an incredible musician and composer, and I'd really love to hear him record some kind of solo project. His only other work that's available online is the soundtrack for Bastion, which he also wrote, which is also an amazing soundtrack. So if you're looking for something dark, ambient, relaxing, and melodic that also has a generous blend of jazz influences added for flavor, I'm pretty sure you'll enjoy the soundtrack. I'm just hoping it gets a physical vinyl release like it deserves. Yeah, so thank you guys for watching this little bit on Music Beat. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching Retro Game Players. Marcus is awesome and his YouTube channel is really cool. It's more fun than shoving mechanical pencils up your nose. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> oh, God. I love that guy. Great job, Arthur. That was an awesome review. And honestly, that soundtrack sounds really epic. Really, really good. I, I got to check that out. So thanks for covering it. Please go check out Pocket Rocket Radio. That channel's really good. And thanks again, man, for appearing on here. So next up, we've got one more segment, and it's Reading Retro. So on this segment of Reading Retro, we're going to be talking about, I'd say, the most iconic gaming magazine of the 90s. That's my opinion, but that's going to be Game Fan. This is issue number two from volume one. And I'll tell you what, this was the magazine that I actually had when I was a kid. Um, this one in particular, I find to be one of the most interesting because it's the first time they actually put it in mass print. The first issue um, was kind of this like indie sort of publication. It's hard to find the very first issue of volume one. Uh, but yeah, Die Hard Game Fan was actually started sometime in 1992, I think it was September, by Tim Lindquist and also Dave Halverson. So the company went through a bunch of weird things. I mean, like, tons of lawsuits, tons of crazy stories are out there about this company during when they were printing the uh, issues and the magazines. But aside from all that, and all, aside from all the drama, the magazine itself is incredible and I'm gonna show you guys some of the pages and just take a look at how amazing the artwork is and the graphics are of these games because back then this stuff was popping out of the book so check this out 
One thing you'll notice right off the bat is that blue dude there. Well, he's the official mascot of Game Fan, the Monitar. And he's got some huge bulbous pectoral muscles, that's for sure. In later issues, they toned that down a little bit. But yeah, he's got a CRT television on his head. And this is the Sonic 2 issue, which I really love that cover. Definitely awesome. So you'll notice right off as you start flipping through this that you'll see vibrant, vibrant images and colors. And this is the most wanted and the top 10. You can see Soul Blazers on the left there for Super Nintendo. I love that game. And then the most wanted is Sonic 2, which of course is a freaking great game. Now this is the viewpoint section and this is like where the editors can review games and do like a short blurb but then give it a score. And sometimes they actually have other aliases uh, where they review the same game or a different game. And they're really funny. They're fun to read. And yeah, this is like one of the highlights of the magazine. But check out the way that they layer background images and then like sprites and then screenshots. I mean, this stuff just pops off the pages. It looks so sharp. Shredder is awesome looking right there. So, and then there's Sunset Riders, of course, which is always cool, but that's the Sega sector. Sonic 2, I mean, look at the spread on this game. I mean, this when this came out, this was one of the funnest games ever. And of course, Road Rash 2, I remember looking at this thinking, I can't wait to play it, and I eventually did get that game, and I still love it to this day. Captain America and the Avengers was a really cool arcade game. And when this thing was ported out, it was a pretty cool game. I I enjoyed it. I just think the arcade game was so much better. And this is Time Gal on the Sega CD. This was a pretty awesome game too. Cybernator on Super Nintendo, that's one of my favorites. I've always loved this game. It's pretty tough, but the huge sprites, awesome explosions. And again, I just love how this is laid out. It's so vibrant. It was so fun to look through this magazine when I was younger. This is Air Zonk on the Turbo Graphics. I think that's really cool too. So again, just awesome they showed different systems. Here's the Neo Geo. This is Viewpoint, the game. And they actually did port that to uh, Sega Genesis at some point, but this was a great, great section. I love looking at Neo Geo stuff. Here's World Heroes. I mean, I was drooling over these graphics. I could not believe how cool they looked. And then this is like a review on some hardware, in this case, Fighting Sticks, which check that one out, the super professional arcade joystick. Other stuff in this issue covers the launch of the Sega CD, so different games that are coming out for it, and kind of all the different developers that are developing for it. I, again, was so, so into the Sega CD at the time, I could not wait to check it out. It was so hyped up. You know, Batman Returns, all this stuff, Lethal Enforcers. And then this is the schedule over here on the left, and this is where they talked about what games were coming out for each month, and you could look forward to it. So that was always pretty cool. It's kind of fun to look and see, you know, what games were going to be coming out, like Test Drive 2, you know, Chuck Rock, Cool World, Cybernator. Under Turbo Graphics, you can see Forgotten Worlds, Prince of Persia, Hit the Ice. So it was just cool to see what was up and coming. You know, there's Sonic 2 coming out in November, December for the Game Gear. I don't know. There was no pre-ordering back then. There was no DLC. Times were simpler. And that does it for this segment of Reading Retro. All right, that does it for this episode of Retro Gaming Sunset. Thank you so much for watching. And as always, do check out the other channels that have been featured on this episode. And if you have a YouTube channel and you'd like to be on an upcoming future episode of Retro Gaming Sunset, let me know. Maybe we can get that going. And until next time, you know what to do. You keep it retro later on.